you are listening to Fanfare Tracks. You're listening to Fanfare Tracks. Flip through the galaxy of literature. Welcome to Cannon Park. You're listening to Cannon Fodder and a very special episode as we welcome to the show Graham Hancock. Graham is the author of Lego Star Wars Force of Creativity, a new coffee table book that arrives on lego.com on the 20th of July. We spoke all about the making of the book, his work as editor of Blocks Magazine and much, much more. So here's myself and Graham Hancock talking all about Lego Star Wars Force of Creativity on Cannon Fodder. So welcome to Cannon Fodder. We're here to talk about your new book, Lego Star Wars, The Force of Creativity. It's a bit of a monster, 312 illustrated pages, 50 interviews, all sorts of great stuff. I haven't read it yet, but I think you probably have proofread it about a million times. Can you tell us, Graham, give us a little sense of what this book is all about? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Mark. Um, So this year is the 25th anniversary of Lego Star Wars. It launched back in 1999 in the lead up to The Phantom Menace being released in cinemas. And to celebrate that, to kind of mark this occasion, to mark 25 continuous years of Lego Star Wars sets, um, I worked on this coffee table book, this big, beautiful, illustrated book that covers everything about the Lego Star Wars experience. We, When you think of Star Wars, right, and you think of the appreciation we have for it, so much of that appreciation is elevated because we know what went into making those movies from all those beautiful art books and things that we've got on our shelves. And this is the book that does that for Lego Star Wars. So we get into how they design the models, how they design the minifigures, the different innovations they've created over the years. We get into the video games. We get into the big build experiences that you have at Star Wars Celebration and elsewhere. We we, we go deep. We cover it all, Mark. So when you started working on the book, as somebody who knows Lego very well, obviously with your work on Blocks Magazine, which we'll talk about in a bit, you know Lego, I wouldn't say inside out, nobody knows everything inside out, but you know know, how the sausage is made, so to speak. Was there anything when you got digging into the book that you suddenly thought, wow, you know, I'd never considered that, or I simply didn't know that? Where, Where did the surprises come from? Oh, there were so many things along the way that surprised me. Um... One thing that I found really interesting was that when we were looking into model design, so how Lego Star Wars models get made from the very beginning, as in when the guys are sitting around thinking, what Lego Star Wars sets could we make this year? Hmm. And then, you know, how they conceptualize them, how they refine them, and, you know, this entire process. I've interviewed people, um, as you say, for Blocks magazine and other places that I've written for. I've interviewed model designers hundreds of times, so I wasn't sure how much there would be that would be new to me. But there's still so many little details and things along the way that surprised me. And part of that is because for the book, we interviewed model designers, but we also interviewed element designers, like engineers who figure out how these elements are going to be pumped out of the machines fast enough. Like we we went into a real sort of level of specifics um, that I've never really been able to before. And I think that makes this making models chapter that we've got really deep and really unique and really packed with rich detail that is really interesting to Lego fans. But I think anyone who's a fan of Star Wars toys is going to be really fascinated to kind of get get the nitty gritty on how these things come to be. Um, but in terms of things that I that I didn't know that also springs to mind, is we've got a chapter on the Lego Star Wars animated content. Yeah. And I spoke yeah. to a lot of the writers and producers of the of the different specials and series over the years. And we were talking about the Lego Star Wars holiday special that's on Disney Plus. Yeah. And uh Gormanda, the chef from the Star Wars holiday special, they had the idea of actually putting Gormanda in the Lego Star Wars holiday special. But unfortunately, it was one of those things that fell by the wayside as they were writing and developing it. But just little tidbits like that, knowing that the Lego Star Wars Holiday Special was going to have that really direct reference to the Star Wars Holiday Special. Things like that really tickled me and really just sort of piqued my curiosity. When you consider the first wave of 
of releases that came out in 99, obviously in and around Phantom Menace, right up to the stuff that's coming out today. What's the big, you mentioned innovation and, and just the process just moving forward as, as naturally it will. What's the biggest difference if I was looking at two sets or two figures that, let's say, the same figure, let's say it's a, I don't know, a Qui Gon on an EOP from 99 to 2024, what would the big differences be? The difference is definitely detail and consistency. Um, and this was something that, so sometimes when you're working on a project like this, you sort of discover a through line along the way that you didn't necessarily know was there. So when I was working on the minifigures chapter, the story of Lego Star Wars minifigures tells the story of how Lego went from just having a handful of people designing these minifigures to having a huge department with like more than 100 people working on designing these minifigures and how they started to informally, but then eventually formally codify their minifigure design standards. So if you look at the early Lego Star Wars minifigures, there's sort of differences between them where you know individual designers have designed this minifigure, but they haven't necessarily lined it up against every other minifigure that they've ever released. Whereas today, if you get any two minifigures together, they go together. They're, yeah. you know, the eyes are the same space apart. The, the way they represent expressions are exactly the same. Um, like, for example, recently, Emperor Palpatine minifigures always had pupils in their eyes. But then when the Lego Star Wars designers went to check how they're supposed to represent evil eyes like Emperor Palpatine has, they realized that you're actually supposed to use these spooky round eyes with no pupils in that just look like pure evil, pure villainy. Yeah. Um, so they adapted the latest version to have eyes like that. So if you look back at those very early figures, there's a bit more differentiation between them. Whereas if you look at the modern figures, there's absolute consistency amongst them. And then, as I say, the level of detail, of course, has massively increased. Again, if, if you look at minifigures from the 1990s and the Lego Star Wars ones that were introduced, everything was about reducing detail because the printing machines and things that were available at that point were not quite as sophisticated as they are today. And if you look at minifigures today, you know, they're still not a gentle giant statue. <laughs> they're still like a big <laughs> reduction in detail versus what the character actually looks like. But but yeah, the significantly more detail than there would have been 25 years ago. Hey, it's Kyle Newman, and you're listening to Fanta Tracks. You spoke to a lot of people for this book. So of the people that you spoke to, I'm assuming there's people that were there at day one right through to today. Who did you speak to? Who did you get access to? One of the key interviewees for the book was Jens Kromvold Fredriksen, and he's the design director of Lego Star Wars. And he designed one of the very first 99 models and then has been working on the theme pretty much ever since. So he really has seen how it's changed, evolved, grown over the years. Um, but I, I was trying, I was thinking when I was working on the book, how do we set all of this up? How do we set the book off on the right note? And I thought, Jens has been working on Lego Star Wars for 25 years. And Doug Chang has been involved in Star Wars since the mid 90s. Mm. What if we got those two guys to talk to each other about their different approaches to design, to, to have Doug talking about movie design and have Jens talking about toy design and see where the parallels are, see where the differences are, really get a flavor for what these two different disciplines are like. So we arranged that conversation. And I just kind of moderated it. I was, uh, I just let those guys talk. I let those guys talk to each other. And the opening uh, prologue to the book is this conversation between Jens and Doug. And because, as I say, they've both been doing this thing, you know, for this entire period of time, it was absolutely fascinating to hear how it's evolved, to hear how they've seen it change, to hear what some of the new toys they get to play with are when they're doing their work. Is there, there must be, there must be a list, a, a complete, concise, maybe not even concise, a complete list of all the Star Wars stuff that's come out between sets, between single figures, between bagged giveaways at special events or whatever it may be. 
if you had to put a, a rough figure or maybe a, a very accurate figure on how much has come out since 99, where would you sort of put that figure at? Oh, let me think, Mark. I think the number 800 is springing to mind. I'm just opening a file to see if I can find my notes on how many I sort of pegged it at. Um, but it, we do in the back of the book have an appendix that's got a list of every single Lego Star Wars boxed set that's been released over the years. Yeah. Now, at one point, I did consider whether we could possibly put, like you mentioned at the events, when you might get a little make and take model where you actually mm. build it there in person and then you get to take it home with you. But, um, but, but tracking down a precise number and, and tracking down the names of all the different make and takes at all the different events around the world over the years. Yeah. It, it's still something that's on my to-do list. It's still something that I'm sort of <laughs> moving away on, but it wasn't something we were able to include in the book. But 900 is the figure I'm going to plump for. There's around 900 okay. different LEGO Star Wars sets. LEGO Star Wars has delved into pretty much every corner of the Star Wars story so far, hasn't it? It really has. I mean, obviously, you know, it started off during the prequels, so it covered all of those films. And then between the prequels and the Clone Wars launching, there was so much time for the LEGO Star Wars designers to go through, you know, the, the six films and see what they've missed. And then they went on the Clone Wars in a big way. And then there was... Again, another period where they delved into everything and pulled out some wonderful obscure vehicles and things. And, you know, we, we've even had expanded universe sets from like the Old Republic and Dark Empire and things. There's some wonderfully obscure models over the years. And in fact, one of the fun anecdotes for, in the book is that when they first started the Ultimate Collector series, the guy who was designing the concept models for that designed a remote control tie crawler Wow. And I just thought it was bonkers of all the Star Wars vehicles to start with, to start with a TIE crawler. Just <laughs> amazing. Um, but yeah, I, that, that's one that would have been wonderful to actually get to play with. I was going to say, what's the most random Star Wars Lego thing you've seen? But I think you've just pretty much put your finger on it. <laughs> well, an, another one that always uh, tickled me was that the um, uh, Anakin's uh, Jedi Starfighter that he had in the Clone Wars micro series and that was nice. released as a Hasbro toy back in the day. So that was released as a Lego set about 10 years after that animation was on TV. And it was just one of those ones that, that showed up. And, you know, I asked the Lego Star Wars guys, you know, what made you do it then? And they just thought it was a cool vehicle. And that's how so many of their decisions are made. They just look at something and think, yeah, that's cool. Let's do it. You know, sometimes it's not all that more complicated than that. That was going to be a question. How do they determine, obviously, with new releases, with Acolyte coming, with all the other stuff we've had, it's, I'm waggling the air quotes, it's obvious. But but when you have the latitude to do something a bit different, how do they make that decision? Is it sometimes just a bunch of Star Wars guys sitting in a room going, wouldn't it be cool if? It really is. And um, So they recently launched the Diorama Collection and the Starship Collection. And these are both collections for adults, display sets. And they've both got relatively consistent uh, sizes. So each diorama is roughly the same size. So if you get all these on a shelf, they're going to look really nice lined up. Same with the Starship Collection. And when they started doing those, uh, those new series, they just built dozens of models for each one. And they just thought, what are the cool seeds? What can we build? built loads and loads of different stuff and then just looked at them all and kind of picked out what are the most iconic scenes what are the most appealing looking models what feedback have we had what do people want so so when these guys are when it's not based on uh new content that's coming up where the, you know there's a bit more involvement with lucasfilm and everything and a bit more discussion on that side when it is just stuff for a new range or something they just go wild come up with every idea build some of them, see what looks good. And um, and yeah, that's how they decide. For everything in one location, daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds, bookmark fathatracks.com for Star Wars news 24-7, 365. Yeah! Because Lego's a modular system in that there's predetermined pieces that go into a set, a designer will sit down and work out what they would need to pull into that set. What are the processes for when they 
can't quite make it work from the bits they've already got? How often do they have to come up with specific unique pieces for sets? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's something that Lego designers tend to avoid where possible in that they always want to show how clever the system is and what you can do with this system. They always want to encourage other people to be creative by proving that you don't need a new element. You can usually do this out of existing things. But obviously, now and again, there's just not quite that piece that they need to do something with. And I mean, over the years, these guys have got better and better at this. And the system itself has got cleverer. So it's even less frequent than it used to be that they will introduce a new element. Um, It's usually if it's something very specific, very iconic. So in Lego Star Wars, you'll often get um, a new cockpit element if they're doing like a specific starfighter at a scale that they haven't done it at before. Because obviously, if the cockpit's wrong, as fans, we're immediately going to spot that. Um, But with Lego Star Wars, the other thing is, they use a lot of so each um play theme within lego has almost like an allocation of how many new elements they can have each year and in lego star wars they want to try and reserve a lot of those for the minifigure heads and things so when they've got like an alien character they want to make sure that they can give that alien character a bespoke head where necessary yeah so they use that for a lot of their new pieces i'm just curious now how many different I think Hasbro called them expressions. Don't they? How many different sort of lines of Lego are there at the moment ongoing? That's a really good question because we don't know what's coming next year. So we don't know exactly which ones will continue and which ones won't. But you've got your, you know, when you picture a Lego Star Wars set, you picture minifigures, you picture a play scale model. Yeah. What they call it. Then you've also got um, the little bagged sets that are usually like a, micro scale version of a spaceship and you get those in the advent calendar as well so you've got the sort of micro scale ones then as i say you've got the diorama collection which is scenes from the movies that are more for display than play sets you've got the starship collection which are sort of desk friendly starships so they're not the massive ones that take up a whole coffee table they're ones that will fit on a bookcase or something you've got the helmet collection which I don't think we've had any new helmets this year, um, but you, but that is representing different helmets from the saga. You've got brick heads, which is little, you know, uh, figures with fun proportions, really kind of funky proportions and bit stylized. You've got Ultimate Collector Series, of course, which is the biggest expressions where you've got yeah, two thousand pieces, five thousand pieces, where you build an absolutely massive replica of a starship. And micro fighters, where it's a little tiny starship, really funky proportions, and then you pop a minifigure in it. So really out of scale and everything, but just a fun little handheld model that you know you can fly around the room. So no matter what your sort of budget is, no matter what bit of Star Wars you're interested in, at the moment there's something for you. It really is. It, it's amazing how diverse the line has got at this stage. And it's one of those rare. Big IPs, rare big toy lines, whereby you can go to the news agents and buy a Lego magazine, and on the cover is a Lego figure that's completely compatible with all the other stuff at home. All the ancillary things that have developed, not just from Star Wars Lego, but from Lego in general over the years. I mean, during the time period of Star Wars and Lego being partners, if you want to call it that, Lego's become pretty much the biggest toy company in the world. So they've really got this damn pat now, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, and I think Lego Star Wars is such a good way to track it because you can see over the years how everything becomes more refined, how everything is, becomes more sophisticated, how they're thinking about the, the system and the compatibility in an even deeper way than they were before. And I mean, you can see that through the new, you know, without getting too nerdy into Lego detail, but you can see with the new elements and things that they introduce that they are even more rigorously thought through and tested than they were 20 years ago. Like the compatibility of this stuff is absolutely next level. And I think it's, I think that dedication to sort of quality and always striving to get that bit closer to perfection. I think that's why the fandom for it is so strong and that's why people love it so much. And I think what also helps and touches on what you were saying it's when it comes to things like the video games, which are obviously 
massive and completely beloved. Every minifigure you see in those video games, every Lego element is authentic to the real thing. Mm. You know, right down to the stickers sometimes looking like they're stickers. Like, it, it, you know, it's <laughs> attention to detail that, the, that they pay with all of the video games, animation, and everything that goes around the actual products themselves, you know, is really second to none. Now, the book's been available for pre-order since the 1st of May. You can only get it on lego.com. The book launches on the 20th of July. What are you expecting your life to be like on the 20th of July when that book is finally out? When I hold a physical copy of this thing, Mark, I'm going to breathe the biggest sigh of relief anyone has (laughs) ever heard. A mixture of relief and delight because, you know, I I can't wait to hold a physical copy for myself, of course. But, but, um, you know, it's been a big old project. It's a huge uh, piece of work. And and seeing it in person is going to reassure me that it is real. It's not just a, a picture on Lego.com. This is this is a physical artifact that, that we can sort of hold and enjoy. And I'll tell you what I'm really looking forward to. We've got a time capsule with the book that's full of artifacts from over the 25 years of Lego Star Wars. And in it, we have got what is possibly a replica of what is possibly one of the rarest Lego Star Wars items ever which is the Toy Fair invite box that was sent out to toy buyers and media to invite them to New York Toy Fair in 1999. So I'm going to get my book out of the box. I'm going to get that Toy Fair box, assemble it, and then I'm going to put my minifigures in it from my collection because I've been so itching to see what that thing looks like in person that I I can't wait to see how it's turned out. You need to record. When you pick the book up and slap it heartily on the cover and hear that lovely thump that a big book makes, you need to record that because that's that's a moment. <laughs> Definitely. That's such a good idea. <laughs> now, before we move on, Blocks Magazine, you're the editor of Blocks Magazine, so this book isn't the only print thing you've got on the go at the moment. You've been with the magazine for quite a long time. How does that occupy your day? Because Lego's not just Star Wars, it's all sorts of other stuff, and it never stops moving, does it? It doesn't. It's it's incredible just how much Lego stuff is going on all of the time. And, you know, you stop and look at one enormous, impressive Lego set that's launched. And then a week later, another enormous, impressive Lego set is launching. And, you know, <laughs> the trip for me as editor of the magazine is always to figure out how to balance these things. But, I mean, you know, with the 25th anniversary of Lego Star Wars, there was no doubt what we were going to put on the cover this month. So this month is our Lego Star Wars 25 special. Uh, Daniel Jamieson did us a really beautiful image that has the Lego R2-D2 projecting the Blocks logo. Mm. And we've got 25 years of Lego Star Wars told through 25 Lego Star Wars sets in there. We've got an interview with the designer of the new Ultimate Collector Series tie interceptor. We talked to Matt Denton about 3D printing a massive version of the Lego Stormtrooper mech. Uh, Nathan Sawaya talks about some of the interesting Star Wars big builds that he's made over the years. So, um, yeah, we've really, really given it a good a good Star Wars theme this month. And I'm, I'm really pleased with how this month's magazine has turned out. It's been a lot of fun to, to work on. <laughs> fun the drags. Stepping back to when you were a kid, you're a Star Wars fan and you're a Lego fan. So what was your first Star Wars toy and what was your first Lego toy? Oh, that is such a good question, Mark. I can't actually remember what my first Star Wars toy would have been. I suspect my first Star Wars toy was a battered vintage Kenner figure that my grandparents had at their house and somehow ended up coming home with us after we'd visited them. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty sure that would be my first Star Wars toy, thinking on it. My first Lego toy was the Lego Pirates Barracuda, the Black Seas Barracuda, this massive Lego pirate ship with red and white striped sails. I loved Lego, loved Star Wars. I just got to that age as a child where, I know I was a bit precocious child. I was always a bit old for my age. And I thought, you know, I can't be playing with these toys anymore. This isn't for me. You know, I'm I'm reading books and comics now. So that, that's my thing. <laughs> but I couldn't resist still having a nosy in Toys R Us and having a look in the Lego section. And I remember the day vividly when I saw the end cap of Lego Star Wars for the first time. I had no idea it was coming. I just saw those boxes on the shelf and my mind was just blown. And if there was one thing in the world that could have kept me in Lego at that time, it was Star Wars. So 
as much as writing the book, obviously, I was thinking of everybody. I was thinking of all the fans who would want to read it, Lego fans and Star Wars fans. It also meant so much to me personally to write about something that had such a such an important impact on me. And uh, yeah, it meant that I I kept my toy hobbies going all the way through, you know, being a teenager and then becoming a grown-up who just has a house that's overrun with toys. <laughs> I hear you. I totally hear you. <laughs> I'm so glad we got a chance to talk, Graham, because we've been mates for years and we've never had you on the show. And this feels like the perfect opportunity to talk about, obviously, this wonderful book. I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing it. Congratulations on all your success. I'm so pleased this has happened for you. Somewhere down the line, we'll have to have you on again. I'm sure there'll be much more Lego to talk about. Anytime, Mark. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Cannon Fodder. For more Star Wars podcast content, be sure to subscribe to Fat Catch Radio on your podcatcher of choice. Subscribe to all our social media at links.fathertax.com. Be sure to be checking out fathertax.com daily for all your latest Star Wars news. And you can also join us live on YouTube for Good Morning Tatooine every Sunday evening at youtube.com forward slash Fanthatrax TV. Coming up next on Fanthatrax Radio, it's Making Tracks.